And now for something completely different. Forget everything you've been told by others before. Get ready for the real deal. The full story. Real talk about money, markets, life. Now, it's The Real Investment Show with Lance Roberts. Presented by RIA Advisors. And good morning. It's Thursday as we get ready. Second best day of the week, of course, as we get ready to wind up the week. Already this uh, first week of the new year already behind us. I told you if you didn't start Christmas shopping early, it's going to be up on you before you know it. 51 weeks left after today. <laughs> so <laughs> get there before you know it. So seriously, folks, a uh, couple of things today to get into, of course, is we're going to be talking with Michael E. Woods uh, on the show today a little bit about the Fed minutes yesterday. Yesterday's market action was the worst response to a Fed minute release ever on record. Just going to say. Uh, market sold off pretty sharply, but um, we actually talked about this yesterday on the show. Uh, this, you know, early morning yesterday, right at this time, we we're talking about the fact the market was more than two standard deviations, you know, overbought. I know a bunch of googly got uh, technical stuff, but all it meant is that, as we said yesterday, the rubber band had kind of gotten stretched a bit, and the market was due for a correction, and the market was behaving. This is actually our three minutes video that we posted out yesterday. Market was behaving very much like we've seen at every other point in history over the last year or so. Uh, the markets rally, they get back up to these kind of overbought conditions, kind of trade sideways and sell off back to the 50 day moving average. Uh, that's what occurred yesterday. Uh, we haven't really done anything yet. So yesterday's sell off was unexpected and uh, was larger than expected. But again, well within the context of what we've been seeing over the course of really the last year or so, because is there more downside now to the markets? Yes, there is. Um, markets could sell off here back down to where we saw previous lows here in December. But even despite all of this uh, you know, sell off yesterday and, and the sheer panic you know, in the financial media yesterday, you know, markets in turmoil, right? Um, markets are only back to where they were December the 28th. So we haven't really given up a whole lot here. But again, uh, you know, the, the, the sheer kind of palpable panic was evident as I was getting emails yesterday is like, oh, my gosh, you know, the, 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 you know, the, I'm losing money. And it's like the, the markets are down a little bit. You know, we've had a nice rally from the December lows, uh, got overbought short term, pull back here, certainly well within the context of things. Now, could the market sell off more? Yes, because look, we are talking about a change now, and this is something that Michael Lee Woods and I'll talk about a little bit more, but you know, as we wrote about in our 2022 outlook and forecast for this year, the big changes ahead of us are starting to occur, and that is the change of liquidity that we've had in the markets over the last year. Well, you know, we've had all this, you know, uh, Federal, Res Federal Reserve stimulus, $120 billion a month in QE, zero interest rates, uh, very accommodative policy. As we talked about yesterday, you know, we had a tremendous amount of government liquidity coming in in the form of checks and direct checks to households, et cetera, that's gone. So those tailwinds that were supporting these asset prices you know, are now starting to all reverse. And, and this is, is, has been something that we've talked about, the real risk of the markets over the last year, and, and particularly in the more speculative areas of the markets. You know, when we were talking uh, last year a lot about uh, Kathy Wood and what's going on with ARK Investments and her, her firm, which is very much all of these meme-type stocks. And we talked about the AMCs, the GameStops, um, all these type of, of companies. These were the companies that were very highly speculative in nature, but they were the disruptors, right? They, we had this record number of IPOs coming to the market of all these disruptor companies and you know Grubhub and Lyft and all these things that were changing the way that we live and work and do things. And, and no doubt about that, right? No doubt about that at all. But uh, valuations become a problem and more importantly, revenue uh, for a lot of these companies is very limited at best. So, you know, these companies that were very speculative in nature, AMC, GameStop, a lot of these other things, 
um, they were being chased by a lot of these retail traders that had a fresh $1,400 check from the government and a, and a Robinhood app in their hand, and they were buying a lot of these stocks. Well, that bloom has really kind of come off the rose, so to speak, here, and those stocks have been under a tremendous amount of pressure, now losing favor. And again, after you lose so much money in the markets, after a while, you just kind of quit. And that's what we're now seeing in a lot of these type of, of meme stocks. In fact, if you take a look at the favorite group of meme stocks, uh, you know, there's a meme stock index. If you take a look at that index, it's actually given up all of its gains from 2021. It's now in the red from 2021. Um, you know, the uh, Kathy Wood's famous arc is now becoming the Titanic, quickly taking on water. So it's just kind of getting you know, worse here. Now, it doesn't mean that this, this dynamic won't change, but my point about all of this and the things that we'll talk a little bit more about today with Michael Leibowitz is that we're in an environment where that liquidity, that support for at higher asset prices is changing. And here's another little tidbit for you. Over the last two years, the top richest you know, 5% of the economy, right? The people that own a vast majority of the indexes have actually been selling more of their stock. So as all these retail traders have been buying stocks, and we've seen retail traders now making up about 20% of the flows in the markets, where do they buy their stock from? See, the stock has to come from somewhere. Somebody has to be selling when other people are buying. There's always a buyer for every seller. So as these retail traders have been buying all these stocks and buying record levels of call options, et cetera, somebody had to be selling it to them. Well, that was the richest one, three, five percent of the economy. So while the, 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 while the while retail traders thinking that they're the smart money have been chasing this market, you know, the ultra rich have been selling, have been willing to sell to them. And that's going to be one of the, the interesting issues this year is to see what reverses. Again, as liquidity comes out of the markets, as interest rates go up, the Fed is now slated to raise rates. There's about an 80 percent probability in the Fed futures markets that the Fed will raise rates four times this year. That's a full percentage point in one year. Um, it is unlikely that the markets will tolerate a 1% increase in Fed funds. Um, there's just a tremendous amount of, of dependency on very low rates. When it comes to corporate stock buybacks, a lot of those buybacks that have been supporting the corporate market have been funded by issuance of cheap debt. A lot of dividends that have been issued out have been funded by cheap debt. In fact, when we take a look at the small cap index, there's a lot of these companies in that index that depend upon cheap debt in order to survive. So once the Fed starts hiking interest rates, debt is no longer cheap. And this may become more problematic as we get further into the year. So, you know, one of the big questions and the, and the things that we're going to discuss in more detail this morning is the risk of a Fed making a policy mistake. We're already starting to see some early indications that supply chain disruptions may be easing, inflationary pressures may be peaking, and now the Fed is going to be starting to lift rates. And this has been one of the big concerns of us, as well as many other commentators in the markets, is that the Fed, as always, is once again behind the curve. Lifting rates now, they should have been lifting rates last year when they had tons of liquidity supporting the markets, but now that that liquidity is gone and the Democrats can't pass another uh, spending bill and we now have midterm elections coming up and you've got inflation and supply chain pressures peaking, they're now going to start raising rates. This could wind up being the Waterloo for the Fed. We'll see what happens here, but this would not be uncommon. This is kind of how we've seen every single uh, former rate hiking campaign end, which has not been good for stocks. So this is something we'll be talking about much more detail this morning. Um, yesterday, we did remove another 5% of our equity exposure very early in the morning yesterday. So again, we've talked about reducing that risk in portfolios. And, and again, we continue to look for that opportunity to do that um, as we watch for this shift in the markets. But we'll get into more of this after the break with Michael Leibowitz. I'm your host, Lance Roberts for The Real Investment Show. Be right back. Get daily investment news you can use. Delivered at the speed of the internet at realinvestmentadvice.com. Don't let 2022 be a repeat of the past year. Join Danny Ratliff and Richard Rosso for their essential smart money tips for the new year candid coffee event on Saturday, January 15th. 
you'll learn the landmines to avoid, tax advantages we see, and money tips you need to know in the new year. Register now for our next Candid Coffee at realinvestmentadvice.com. Candid Coffee with Ratliff and Rosso, realinvestmentadvice.com. Anyone can sell you insurance and they'll gladly take your premium dollars. The RIA Insurance Agency can provide you with insurance solutions tailor-made for your needs and lifestyle. Because everyone's assets are different, let RIA Insurance review what you need to protect and how. We won't sell you insurance, but what you need will be a matter of policy. RIA Insurance Agency. 888-915-0780. 888-915-0780. Realinvestmentadvice.com. Click on the insurance tab. What worries you about your money? Enhance your financial success with RIA Advisors' free financial planning tool, MyBlocks. It's our online modular manager for your money and your life. Does your vision of retirement match up to reality? MyBlocks can help to determine how much you'll need and how you can achieve. Create your own personal financial vision for the next decade with MyBlocks, our free tool at RIAAdvisors.com. Click on the Client Portal tab, RIAAdvisors.com. And now, another page from the Real Investment Advisors Investing Manifesto. Manage risk and volatility rather than trying to manage gains. You don't have to be right all the time. Long-term investing success is a 70% gain. Let us help you reach your financial goals with RIA Advisors. Neither bull nor bear. RIA Advisors. 281-501-1791 or online at realinvestmentadvice.com. The Real Investment Show. And welcome back this morning. I'm your host, Lance Roberts. Of course, uh, Michael Leibowitz joining me as well as we start looking at kind of where we are in the markets and looking at what the Fed said yesterday. Uh, and then this is really going to become probably a, a topic that we're going to talk about a good bit over the course of the next uh, few months in particular as we kind of get further into this rate hiking campaign or, or monetary policy campaign that the Fed is trying to embark on. And it's going to be interesting to, to see how this plays out, particularly, as I was saying a moment ago, that and and this is the part where we'll kind of start as and this was something that was in our daily commentary yesterday so if you go to our website realinvestmentadvice.com click on our daily commentary link at the top um, you'll get today's commentary but at the bottom is a link to the his to the archives and yesterday's daily commentary we discussed that we're already starting to see some early indications that some of these supply chain disruptions and ultimately uh, this will tie over into the uh, manufacturing sector as well as to the inflationary pressure sector already starting to show some signs of peaking and reversal. And, and that may come at a very inopportune time with a Fed that now seems to be a little bit panicking. Uh, if we take a look at their minutes from yesterday, and we'll talk about those, they seem to be a little bit on the panicky side of this inflation issue. You know, they thought it was going to be transitory for quite some time. And now all of a sudden it's like, oh, my gosh, it's going to it's you know, inflation's here to stay. We better start doing something now and do it quick. Um, this may lead to a, you know, the one thing that Mike and I have feared the most. And we've talked about this numerous times here on the show is a policy mistake by the Fed. Mike, good morning. Welcome to the show. Good morning. Um, I would say a lot panicky, not a little panicky. <laughs> so, yeah. I, I mean, you look at their minutes. So the Fed released their minutes yesterday from their December 15th meeting. And they typically do that. It comes about three weeks later. And we've talked about this, but the minutes are not necessarily the actual minutes. It's not exactly what everyone said. They're kind of doctored up minutes yeah. that reflect what was said at the meeting, but also what's happened over the last few weeks. You actually have to wait, I believe it's seven years, to get the, the actual words that people spoke. <laughs> and quite often, as we learned with 2008, those words are a little different than what the minutes say. Yeah. So this is a, uh, what do we call it, window dressing yep. event for the Fed. But this is their way to relay their current thinking. And they raised eyebrows yesterday. Basically, what they said well, is... Hold on, let's, like let's, let's back up before we get there, because again, as I said, where I want to start is, and let's talk about 
these current kind of ISM numbers as well as the inflationary okay. numbers because before we start talking about what they said, I think it's important to lay the groundwork for where we are Fair. economically. Fair. And you Fair. know, if you take a look at ISM, um, take a look at some of these inflationary readings that we're getting on the supply chain side, those do seem to maybe have peaked and have actually turned lower. Yeah. Yeah, and actually in today's commentary, which will be out in exactly an hour. Actually, it's out right now. Just go to the website and click on the link. There you go. <laughs> it, uh, if you subscribe to our email, you'll get it in an hour. Uh, you, uh, we, we actually show a, a chart of chips and the delivery delays, and you can see that those are also starting to come back. So if you just think about chips, there's been a car, new car shortage, right? And this is a good example for the whole economy. But because the, the car manufacturers can't get chips, they can't produce cars, there's a shortage of new cars. So what do people do? A, they can't turn in cars to buy new cars, but they also buy used cars, those that need cars. So the price of used cars has gone up significantly, and that's created inflation. Yeah. And there's inflation in new cars because car dealers don't have to negotiate anymore. They can name their price. As those chips come online, and we're starting to see that already, and you're starting to see, you know, if you kind of drive around and look at the lots, mm -hmm. the lots are not full, but they're starting to fill up a little bit. They're starting to look a little bit more normal. That will that will result in car prices, both new and used, at a minimum flatlining, but most likely coming back down. Used car prices will come back down. New car prices, we'll have to wait and see. Yeah, but that holds true for the whole economy yeah. as supply comes online. Yeah, no, it's interesting when you talk about used cars in particular. You know, used cars are up 40% over the last year. And, and the interesting byline to that is that people buying a used car now, um, say I buy a 2019, 2020 used car, and I pay 40% more than the value of the car is worth, right? When I go to trade that in, I'm pulling a lot of negative equity in that car. And, and again, once these used car prices start to fall, this is really going to cause a problem for buyers of cars in the future and then this is one you know this is one of those feedback effects that we don't talk about enough so if i buy a car and i've got a lot of negative equity in it because i've overpaid for it when i go to buy a new car or, or, or a new used car and i go to trade that car in on it i've got to roll that negative equity into the new car which raises my payment and increases my negative equity in that car and eventually i get trapped into the point where i can't trade in a car I've got to run that car out at some point to get rid of that negative equity. And, and this is going to impact the auto market in the future where we'll see potentially, you know, a lack of sales from people not being able to roll their cars over because of all this negative equity they're carrying. Right. We saw that with housing. Yeah. Right. There was negative equity in houses and people couldn't afford to sell it because yep. they'd have to they'd have to throw money on the table at settlement. Mm hmm. So you're right. We are going to see that in cars. And these are the distortions that get created when you shut down an economy and at the same time give everyone a lot of money to spend. <laughs> well, you know, it's, right? it's interesting. My, my next door neighbor, I, I, I was uh, talking to him the other day. He's got two new cars sitting in his driveway, brand new. He bought one for him and his wife. And he said, yeah, went, we, we decided to buy new cars. And so we went down and bought new cars. Great. No problem. So I started asking him about the car. The car is brand new off the lot, right? But it's missing some key ingredients like GPS right. because of lack of chips. And he's like, okay, I don't really use, I use my phone most of the time anyway. I don't use GPS. But what you miss about that is when you go to resell that car, people that are going to buy your car used want GPS in it. And that's going to hurt the right. trade-in value of that car. But again, we're seeing a lot of that impact from those from that semiconductor supply shortage. So to your point now, we're starting to see those chips come back online. You know, we could see a lot of other... And my, my point about used cars and new cars in particular that are missing components because of chips, we may see a, 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 an ex, a, another damage come from the lack of semiconductors rolling through other areas of the market. Well, we saw that with my new computer. I got a new computer <laughs> a few months ago, and I was having all kinds of issues, including dialing into this uh, the show. Right. And after a lot of back and forth, it turns out that one of my problems is that the chips they used, it, it's it's got all the chips. Some of them are just inferior chips because they couldn't source the chips they, they fully tested. Mm -hmm. So I have partially tested chips in my <laughs> computer. Now, it's working great. There have been a lot of updates to drivers and stuff like that, but the, everything has chips now, yeah. right? 
So how many of the products that we bought, we just bought a new oven. Uh, you know, I'm wondering if that has some inferior chip that may not show up now, but in six months or two years is going to create problems. Yeah. And I think I think we're going to see a lot of that roll through the economy. You know, uh, we we were making a lot of substitutions to try to get product delivered, and I think we'll see a lot of, as is always the case, you'll see a lot of inferior products, you know, come to surface after a couple of years. But, I, I, you know, one of the things that we talked about, and this is, you know, uh, again, we're starting to see this kind of thawing. If you take a look at ISM, as in the, which is the Institute of Supply of, of Manufacturers Index. Um, that looks to have peaked. We're starting to see delivery times start to to, to uh, pick up. We're starting to see new orders slow down a bit. So we're seeing some of that demand runoff uh, begin as a lot of that liquidity that we provided people. And again, we're, we're the child tax credit, which was the last of all these stimulus bills, it just ended on December the 15th. So all that liquidity that was in the system, expanded unemployment benefits, child tax credits, uh, direct checks to households, that's all kind of come out of the system. So that demand is now starting to slow. And we're now starting to see that effect run through some of these indexes. Now, that's going to lead, you know, if, if we do continue to see things like manufacturing slow down, new orders slow down, delivery times pick up, that's going to start to pull off some of these inflationary pressures. And, you know, this is kind of the point of the conversation that we'll come back after the break and talk about, particularly with the Fed, is that the Fed's panicking about inflation, which they may be too late now. I mean, the inflation surge may be peaking and they may be hiking right into a peak of inflation. Or they see something that we don't see, right? Like one can make an argument that wages are going to create inflation, wage, you know, the demand for labor. Mm -hmm. So, you know, w the problem is we don't know what they're thinking, why they why they thought this was transitory for so long when it was becoming obvious six months ago it wasn't and why they flipped on a dime. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, do they see something? Is it political? Are they getting too much pressure from the media, from Congress, from the president? That, you know, that that's, I think, a problem, right? It, it's they, they're not transparent enough. They're not telling us why all of a sudden what changed over the last month and a half. I think you, I think that, you, I think it, you're giving the Fed way too much credit because all we have to do is look back in history and see that they always hike rates late cool. in the game. You know, they do everything backwards, to, you know, instead of redu using liquidity to hike rates into they, they do it backwards and hike rates. And we saw this in 2018, uh, September of 2018, the economy starting to slow down. We're starting to see things uh, starting to pull back and they're hiking rates saying we're nowhere near the neutral rate and the market declines 20%. And they go, oh, guess what? We're, we're at the neutral rate now. <laughs> right, so, right. I, I would actually <clears throat> say all you got to do is look back and see the day after that Biden renominated Powell, inflation yep. became a problem. Yep. <laughs> and, yeah, and, and so I, I think you're giving them too much credit saying they see something we don't. I think the, the, the fact is that they're not seeing the things that we see. I'm not saying right. we're smarter than the Fed. I'm just saying I think we look at this more objectively we're open than the Fed. Yeah. And I think that they're missing the, the bigger picture here. But we'll talk about specifically when we come back from the break. I've got some quotes from their minutes yesterday. We'll break those down, talk about them with Michael Leibowitz, and discuss more of where we wind up to. Again, uh, big sell-off yesterday. Not that, you know, not that big in terms of or, or unexpected. Uh, we had actually talked about a potential sell-off yesterday. Um, but where does it go to from here? So all that with you and your money coming up right after the break. The Real Investment Advice blog. It's required reading for the informed investor. Catch it today at realinvestmentadvice.com. Don't let 2022 be a repeat of the past year. Join Danny Ratliff and Richard Rosso for their essential Smart Money Tips for the New Year Candid Coffee event on Saturday, January 15th. You'll learn the landmines to avoid, tax advantages we see, and money tips you need to know in the new year. Register now for our next Candid Coffee at realinvestmentadvice.com. Candid Coffee with Ratliff and Rosso, realinvestmentadvice.com. Anyone can sell you insurance and they'll gladly take your premium dollars. The RIA Insurance Agency can provide you with insurance solutions tailor-made for your needs and lifestyle. 
Because everyone's assets are different, let RIA Insurance review what you need to protect and how. We won't sell you insurance, but what you need will be a matter of policy. RIA Insurance Agency, 888-915-0780, 888-915-0780, realinvestmentadvice.com. Click on the insurance tab. And now, another page from the Real Investment Advisors Investing Manifesto. A passive investment portfolio requires active risk management. It's not a choice, it's necessity. Diversification doesn't protect against risk of loss. Let us actively help you reach your financial goals with RIA Advisors. Neither bull nor bear. RIA Advisors, 281-501-1791 or online at realinvestmentadvice.com. Can't catch the whole show now? Listen to our podcast later at realinvestmentadvice.com. If you have money, you can get access to debt, right? People loan you money if you have money. If you don't need money, the banks are happy to lend you money. And if you owe the bank a lot of money, the banks are happy to loan you money because they don't want you to default. They're just going to lend you more money to try to hope. And it's like, if you owe the bank $100,000, it's your problem. If you owe the bank a million dollars, it's the bank's problem. The Real Investment Show podcast. Same show, your schedule at realinvestmentadvice.com. Do you know what you don't? know when hiring and retaining quality employees compensation is more than just wages it's personal time off the vacation days health care benefits a 401k do you know what's important to them hi i'm tom allen ria advisors retirement plan consultant let us show you how to make the most of an affordable effective package that will deliver true value for your business and your employees call me toll free at 855 ria plan or online at realinvestmentadvice.com Real Investment Show podcasts are now available from Stitcher Smart Radio at Stitcher.com. Hi, Lance Roberts here. If you're like most people, your 401k plan represents the bulk of your retirement assets. And unfortunately for many, managing your 401k plan can be difficult. There's so many choices, so many things to consider. With just a quick email, a couple of questions, you can put RIA advisors to work for you managing your 401k plan. It's a quick and easy application. Just simply click Ask a Question at realinvestmentadvice.com or give us a call at 855-RIA-PLAN. That's realinvestmentadvice.com. Join Danny Ratliff and Richard Rosso for their essential smart money tips for the new year candid coffee event on Saturday, January 15th. You'll learn the landmines to avoid and money tips you need to know in the new year. Register now for our next Candid Coffee at realinvestmentadvice.com with Ratliff and Rosso, realinvestmentadvice.com. You're listening to The Real Investment Show. And welcome back to the show this morning. So NASDAQ's uh, poised this morning for um, some more selling. Um, it's going to be a little bit lighter here, at least at the open, than it was yesterday. But again, concerns over you know rising interest rates by the Fed, a more aggressive policy by the Fed. And, and this is really kind of the, the moment, I guess, that we've all kind of been waiting for in terms of you know, the Fed's been talking about hiking rates. They've been talking about tapering their balance sheet. The market really hasn't been taking them all that seriously about it until yesterday. Um, and that was when the Fed minutes came out from December, the December Fed meeting. And the commentary enclosed in that those minutes were a bit more hawkish than what the markets were anticipating. And that led to the sell off yesterday. Um, on inflation, this is what the Fed said in their minutes. Participants remarked that inflation readings had been higher and were more persistent and widespread than previously anticipated. Some participants noted that trim mean measures of inflation had reached decade high levels and that the percentage of product categories with substantial price increases continued to climb. So this is something that we've all been talking about for months and months and months and months, right? And, and we've been talking about higher food costs, higher gasoline prices. It's been everywhere in the media. And, you know, the, the Fed has pretty much been playing this off, saying, well, you know, we're watching it, we're paying attention to it. Well, apparently we're paying attention close enough <laughs> because all of a sudden uh, they realize that uh, these uh, inflationary pressures may not be, be going away anytime soon. And this is where we left off in, in the last segment with Michael Leibowitz is, is talking about the Fed's policy change now uh, you almost seem a little bit late to the party, Mike. 
Yeah, and, and I would, I think it's worth just uh, discussing one quick thing. This is why we talk about some of this boring macroeconomic stuff at times, because this is what drives the Fed. And knowing that inflation was a problem and is a problem, we knew eventually the Fed would catch on to that. Mm -hmm. And the problem is that the Fed is providing so much liquidity to markets, they in a way have become the leader of markets. So if the Fed has to back off because of too much inflation, that potentially poses a problem for markets. Right. So that's why sometimes we have these boring, boring rants about <laughs> ISM, about inflation, about you know consumer sentiment, about some things that people may not want to hear about because that's what the Fed looks at, and that's what that's what. Uh, the Fed uses to dictate monetary policy, which monetary policy has become stock market policy. Right. Well, and again, and, and it's all about liquidity, right? I mean, and and right. we talked about this. And if you go to our website um, today at realinvestmentadvice.com, you, you know, Michael Michael's article up on the 2022 outlook is up. I also have one from Tuesday talking about outlook risk. And while they take kind of the same tack from different angles, the, the one of the the you know, kind of consistent messages is, is that the support for the markets over the last year, these tailwinds, whether it's liquidity, it's low interest rates, it's very accommodative policy, it's uh, a lot of, of liquidity flowing into households. Uh, those tailwinds are now becoming headwinds. And, you know, this is going to impact, you know, higher rates are going to impact corporate share buybacks. It's going to make those less lucrative to do. Um, it's going to impact demand. It's going to create slower economic growth. That's going to impact earnings for corporations. And, and earnings estimates right now are very high. Corporate profit margins are at all-time record. Those are going to shrink from higher paces of inflation. So there's a lot of these you know, points that we're discussing right now that have been great supports for the market over the last year. Those won't be supports for the markets this year. Does that mean the markets are going to crash? No, that doesn't mean that at all. But it does mean that we may see a, a rather significant pickup in market volatility. We could see a 10 or 15 or 20 percent decline at some point this year. Um, that would certainly not be outside the realm of normal historical standards. In fact, last year we had a year where the maximum drawdown was just a smidge over 5 percent. That's very low volatility for a, any given market year going back to 1900. Most years, we have a 10% drawdown or more. And importantly, after years where you have a very small drawdown in the market, it's very low volatility. In fact, you know, 2017 was one of the last years we had with exceptionally low volatility. The biggest drawdown in 2017 was about 3%. 2018, you had a 19% drawdown at the beginning of the year and a 20% drawdown at the end of the year. So again, low volatility years tend to beget higher volatility years. And I think that that's an important point for us to be thinking about in terms of our portfolio management and, and the things you're doing with your money as we move in this year. Am I saying that's absolutely going to happen? No, I'm not, um, because things can change. The Fed could come out next week and go, you know what, we didn't like that sell-off on, on uh, Wednesday, we're going to reverse our policy. Um, <laughs> you know, we saw them do that in December of 2018. After a 20% drawdown, the Fed said, yeah, we were just kidding about those rate hikes. Uh, <laughs> we're, you know, we're all good. So, and the market started to recover. So again, as Mike said, and this, uh, this is a really important point for Mike, the, the Federal Reserve has been setting and dictating kind of really the stock market action over the last several years. Is that a fair statement? Yeah, but here's the other thing to to piggyback on your comment. Let's say that Lance is right and we get a 20% drawdown in 2022. What we you know, it's say you know, it's very tempting to say, "Okay, I'm going to sit on cash yep. starting January 1st and I'm going to wait for that 20% drawdown and I'm going to pop in and get everything on sale. Yeah, you My won't. stocks on sale." Yeah, you won't. The problem with that <laughs> the problem with that is that where's that 20% drawdown going to start from? Well, what if we rally 30% between now and March, then we drop 20%. Well, and the other side of it too is, and look, this is the historical nature of human psychology is that once you're in the middle of the 20% draw, now you're down 20%, you should be buying. And now you don't buy because you're convinced now that it's going down 40%. Right. right? And here's the, right. And here's the tricky part with the Fed. 
typically when the market's down 20 percent, the Fed starts making a U-turn and walking back whatever policy it was mm -hmm. that they had before. And we saw this in 2018. Yep. Why was the market down 20 percent twice in 2018? Because that's when the Fed decided that they were going to shrink their balance sheet. What did the Fed say yesterday? That they're they're starting to talk about shrinking their balance sheet and sooner rather than later. Yeah. So the market's thinking, okay, we'll get a 20% drawdown, maybe even more. But what we've seen time and time again is that at some point the Fed puts the brakes on that. Uh, and the Fed will say, okay, we were just kidding about QT. <laughs> Raising rates, that's not going to happen. In fact, we're going to do a little bit more QE. Yeah, in fact, this is what they said yesterday in their meeting minutes. Uh, participants had initial discussion about the appropriate conditions and timing of the starting balance sheet runoff relative to raising the federal funds rate. Now, this is interesting because Mike and I discussed this on the show a few weeks ago is what the Fed should do is hike rates while they still have their balance sheet running and then run off their balance sheet. But and, and this is so this is what they're discussing yesterday. They also discussed how this relative timing might differ from the previous experience in which the balance sheet runoff commenced almost two years after policy rate liftoff when normalization of the Fed funds rate was judged to be well underway. Almost all participants agreed that it would likely be appropriate to initiate the balance sheet runoff at some point after the first increase in the target range for the Fed funds rate. That target increase has moved up to March from May. So now they're talking about not only hiking rates in March and the probability, by the way, of four Fed rate hikes in 2022 is now over 80%. They're going to be talking about hiking rates four times this year and running off their balance sheet all at the same time. Um, that's not taking away the punch bowl. That's taking it away and hiding it in the back cupboard um, where nobody can find it and putting a lock on the door. Right, right. And I, I actually, a, uh, one of our readers and clients actually asked me a question last night that I think is probably worth discussing briefly on a call. And he said, how does the Fed reduce their balance sheet? So right now, the Fed's balance sheet is roughly $9 trillion. And in March, the Fed will stop adding to that number. But what's important to note is that $9 trillion, some of it matures all the time. Every month, there are bonds maturing. Mm -hmm. So if the Fed did nothing, it goes, it'll drop somewhat rapidly from $9 trillion on down as bonds mature. So what the Fed does, even when they're not buying QE to keep a flat, to keep a stable balance sheet is they're buying enough to offset what's maturing. So even when there's not QE going on, they're still buying assets to just simply keep the size of their balance sheet the same. Yep. So it's their size of the balance sheet is what they're focused on. So if we go to what's called QT or quantitative tightening, what the Fed do, would do is let bonds mature and not buy back bonds to offset those or just buy back a, a, a lesser amount. Right. And their balance sheet size will start decreasing, which means liquidity in the market because of the Fed will start decreasing, not what we're seeing today where it's just growing at a lesser rate. Yep. And that's a, a very big distinction. And, and this is and this is a very important distinction. And, and like you said, and said this is uh, one of the, the from the Fed minutes yesterday. I'll spit this out. Just bear with me a second. <laughs> Many participants judge that the appropriate pace of the balance sheet runoff would be faster than it was during the previous normalization episode. This is really the statement that spooked the market yesterday. Many participants judged that the monthly caps on the runoff of securities could help ensure the pace of runoff would be measured and predictable, particularly given the shorter weighted average maturity of the Fed's balance sheet. This is what this is it's precisely what what Mike is saying is that a lot of the bonds that the Fed has been buying during QE have very short maturities. So they know exactly when those maturities are going to occur. So they can say, well, we've got $10 billion that are maturing next week. We're not going to replace any of those and reduce our balance sheet by $10 billion. Or we've got $20 billion the week after. We're only going to replace $5 billion. So they know when these things are going to mature and they, can, they, can, they know the pace at which they can reduce their balance sheet. And what they're saying is, is that we're going to let it mature and run off faster than we previously anticipated that's what the markets didn't like that's the taking away of the punch bowl be right back after the break we'll talk about what to do now with your money in the market now that we know this is going on be right back
Get daily investment news you can use. Delivered at the speed of the internet at realinvestmentadvice.com. Don't let 2022 be a repeat of the past year. Join Danny Ratliff and Richard Rosso for their essential smart money tips for the new year candid coffee event on Saturday, January 15th. You'll learn the landmines to avoid, tax advantages we see, and money tips you need to know in the new year. Register now for our next Candid Coffee at realinvestmentadvice.com. Candid Coffee with Ratliff and Rosso, realinvestmentadvice.com. Anyone can sell you insurance and they'll gladly take your premium dollars. The RIA Insurance Agency can provide you with insurance solutions tailor-made for your needs and lifestyle. Because everyone's assets are different, let RIA Insurance review what you need to protect and how. We won't sell you insurance, but what you need will be a matter of policy. RIA Insurance Agency. 888-915-0780. 888-915-0780. Realinvestmentadvice.com. Click on the insurance tab. Hi, Lance Roberts here. If you're like most people, your 401k plan represents the bulk of your retirement assets. And unfortunately for many, managing your 401k plan can be difficult. There's so many choices, so many things to consider. With just a quick email, a couple of questions, you can put RIA advisors to work for you managing your 401k plan. Get started right now at the website, realinvestmentadvice.com, or simply call our toll-free number, 855-RIA-PLAN, or again, simply online at realinvestmentadvice.com. And now, another page from the Real Investment Advisors Investing Manifesto. Bulls win in bull markets. Bears win in bear markets. Eagles soar above and take advantage of opportunity. Let us help you soar as you reach your financial goals with RIA Advisors. Neither bull nor bear. RIA Advisors, 281-501-1791 or online at realinvestmentadvice.com. The Real Investment Show. And welcome back to the show this morning. Michael Leibowitz joining me as well. So talking about the Fed and the tighter monetary policy here, again, something that we've been talking about for months. This is really not a surprise. What was a bit more of a surprise was in the minutes that came out yesterday, and this is what spooked the markets, as we said, is that the speed at which the Fed is looking to take action. Now, again, I want to be really clear about this. This is what they discussed at a meeting that occurred in December. What they actually do doesn't necessarily have to dovetail with what they said in this meeting. That's what they were discussing then. Things have changed now over the course of the last few weeks. We've seen a peak in some inflationary pressures. We've seen some peak in some of the economic data. We may see them start to kind of backpedal on some of these things. So, again, you want to be careful about making knee-jerk reactions in your portfolio like, oh, my gosh, the Fed's tightening rates. I'm going to sell everything and go to cash. Be careful about that because, again, the Fed is known, very well known, for changing their mind fairly quickly, <laughs> especially when the markets don't participate. So, you know, be careful with the actions that you take in your portfolio. Yesterday morning, um, we had talked about on the show that markets were overbought. We'd had a big rally from, you know, the, the we had the, the nice Santa Claus rally in December and the first day of January was, you know, doing fine. And markets kind of started peaking out. Uh, we were overbought. Markets have been struggling to make advances. And so we discussed yesterday morning that a, a pullback to the 50-day moving average was very likely. Now, normally that pattern, and, and this was in our three minutes video yesterday, that pattern was is that correction to the 50-day moving average occurs around options expiration week. And so we said this market could struggle sideways here for another couple of weeks and then have a correction back to the 50-day moving average. Well, the minutes yesterday spooked the markets and we corrected back to the 50-day moving average, which is where we'll be today. So again, nothing really critical has happened to the market other than you had a correction one day. And if you We're take a look at the if you take a look at the 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 media, it's markets in turmoil, right? <laughs> it's like you know get out of the markets. So I want to be careful that you know with what Mike and I are saying here is there's certainly some concerns about the markets through the rest of this year. 
but that doesn't mean go panic, make knee-jerk reactions to your portfolio today. You know, portfolio management is about is like a game of football. It's a it's a game of inches, right? So you want to make small changes, make adjustments. Markets are oversold here short term already, so we're likely to see a bounce, and some of these stocks give you a better opportunity to to rebalance risk in your portfolio. Okay, I'm sorry, Mike. I was just finishing up my thoughts here, uh, but I do want to talk about now. Um, you know, what do we start thinking about in terms of the portfolio and and terms of you know, what should people be doing with their money now that we kind of have this expectation of tighter policy and, and less punch bowl uh, on the table? Right. And that's why it's very important to study the market, not just that it was down 2%, we need to be scared, but what was up yesterday? What what was flat yesterday? What, you know, what type of stocks, what industries, what sectors, what subsectors, what asset classes, uh, where, how did commodities do? And I think 2000 provides a very nice uh, roadmap to some degree. In 2000, in 19, you know, late 90s, the tech stocks were booming, and so-called value stocks were struggling mightily. These are companies that were trading at low PEs, at very low valuations, that there was value in. And then if you look ahead to 2000 and 2003, the exact opposite of the late 90s happened, where value outperformed. So the key is, let's just focus on how the market's rotating between sectors, between types of stocks. Mm -hmm. And let's see if it's real, if it's just temporary. So we've seen over the last, like, what, six weeks, four weeks, staple, consumer staples, utilities, real estate, and healthcare leading the way. Those tend to be lower uh, lower valuations, they tend to have decent dividends, more conservative, lower beta, less risk, right? Now, they've had a rough, you know, some of those sectors have had a very rough time for the last two years. Uh, you know, so, like, uh, you know, utilities, for instance, are only up mm -hmm. 10% since, since just, when COVID started. Just 10%. Other sectors are up, <laughs> other sectors are up a lot, lot more, right? I know. Up 80, 90, 100%. Yeah. So, so, you know, it's easy to say, okay, let's buy utilities, let's buy healthcare, let's buy that stuff. But it's not that easy either. These rotations can be very temporary. So what's important is to keep following where the money's going, where the money's coming from. Are the trends that are in place for the last couple of weeks sustainable? Do they make sense? How does that play into the Fed tightening policy and, you know, the economy is slowing. It mm -hmm. doesn't mean we're going into a recession, but we can't keep growing at five, six, seven percent because the natural growth rate is two percent or even less. Right. Right. So it, we're normalizing. Monetary policy is normalizing. The economy is normalizing. And just generally, things are normalizing in society. So. So we're going to normalize. What does that mean? Does that mean that the stocks that languished for the last two years are going to be the best? Maybe, maybe not. But pay attention. And this year, unlike last year, like Lance said, the tail, the the uh, headwinds go away, and you have more. The tailwinds go away. You have more headwinds. So focus on those headwinds. And if we're going to have high inflation, which stocks will do well? If mm -hmm. inflation is going to come down, which stocks? Do well if the Fed is in tightening mode. Is that good or bad for bonds? What does it mean for for utilities that pay higher dividends or real estate that pays higher dividend? Tech stocks that are that are high growth, high beta. Is how does rates affect them? So, you know, I think one of the lessons for this year versus last year is it's going to take a lot more skill to decipher these trends and to figure out which which are the investing trends to stick with this year. Last yeah. year, it was relatively easy. This yeah. year is going to be much more difficult. Yeah, it is. And, and again, I think, you know, and one thing that, you know, we've harped on, you know, numerous times is that fundamentals are going to matter. And, you know, there's a, a lot of stocks in the market, and I'm actually writing a report about this right now, talking about all the exuberance in the markets last year. And one of the, the signs of exuberance is, people willing to pay 20 times or more price to sales for companies. And those are at a record. And, and you know, one of the things that I think we are going to see more of this year is that fundamentals are going to start to matter. People are going to start to become a little bit more discriminant about making sure that the companies they invest in actually earn money. 
Uh, so we could see, uh, you know, some changes in that. And again, you know, to your point, and this is why if, if you take a look at our portfolios, the way we're the way we structure our portfolios, we have, you know, value and growth sectors in our portfolio. So we, we hedge our portfolio have been hedging our portfolio with value, which we've paid a little bit of a penalty for in the past because it's providing a hedge. But that's also now performing a, a buffer when you have a rotation to those sectors out of the growth sectors of your portfolio. So, you know, diversification truly does matter, but it's it's a function of how you do it within your portfolio as well. Right. And when, right? So one of the discussions we've had is, do we sell little growth? Do we buy low value? And we're not there yet, but those are the types of things that we're thinking about all the time. Do, do tech, is technology still going to lead the way? Are those FANG stocks, remember the five or six, seven generals, the Microsofts, yep. Apples, are they still going to be the ones that lead the market higher or will they lead the market lower? Mm -hmm. What does it mean that ARC, you talked about ARC earlier, ARC funds are doing horrendous. Are the meme stocks finally falling out of favor? And does that mean that the Procter Gamble's of the world's and Clorox's and the the value companies that pay nice dividends will finally have their day in the sun. And there is no answer right now. The answer comes over time. And, you know, unfortunately, the answer comes in the rearview mirror a lot. So it's, you know, you have to, there's a lot to put together. Mm -hmm. And this year ain't going to be last yeah. year. I know that. Well, and I, and I think I think one of the big things is, is too, is, you know, also don't throw babies out with the bathwater. Um, you know, we talked about, and I've got an article out coming out tomorrow talking about our investor resolutions. And we actually had posted the resolutions in our daily market commentary on Monday. But one of those resolutions is to buy damaged opportunities, not damaged stocks. And, you know, this is a very important point is that when you're going through these rotations, there are companies that that when the NASDAQ is selling off, everybody just kind of, you know, because of all the passive indexing that we have going on in the markets today and everybody just dumping their ETFs um, kind of in a selling panic, that impacts all stocks across the market, right? And so you get these these larger, swifter declines in markets because, and, and this is a function of the lack of liquidity that Mike and I have discussed so many times in the past, but those also provide opportunities to buy damaged opportunities. Now, you want to make sure that you're buying good quality stocks with strong earnings and strong balance sheets that have been kind of sold off in general with the markets, not buying stocks that are fundamentally broken that have, have been selling off of the market as well. So it's important to be able to differentiate between a damaged opportunity and a damaged stock. And if you take a look at a lot of the ARC funds, a lot of those companies are damaged stocks. Those aren't damaged opportunities. And that's going to be a very important differentiator uh, in your portfolio as, as you go forward is making sure that you own good quality companies. Again, at the end of the day, and as we've talked about so many times, fundamentals do matter. Valuations matter. It's only a function of when they matter. And, and with the Fed hiking rates and taking away that punch bowl, valuations are going to start to matter in portfolios a whole lot more. Now, if you need help, We've got a couple of solutions for you. One, go to our website, send us your questions, comments, emails right there at the website, realinvestmentadvice.com. Always happy to help you there. Also check out simplevisor.com. We provide all the analysis on stocks every day. Top momentum stocks, top relative strength stocks, areas you want to be looking at, top ETF sectors, all there on the website for you at simplevisor.com, along with our portfolios. You can follow our portfolios right there as well, simplevisor.com. Have a great day. We'll be back tomorrow morning. Uh, Danny and Rich be here for Financial Fitness Friday. Stick around. Three minutes on markets and money coming up. So much stuff at the website, realinvestmentadvice.com. You're really missing out if you're not visiting the website, realinvestmentadvice.com. See you tomorrow. It's a rich, bad, swirl.